We're delighted to welcome Dr. Paul Bokasoma to speak to us about his recent book entitled The Morality and Legality of Secession. Um, Dr. Bokasoma is going to speak about his book for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we will open up the floor to questions and comments. For questions and comments, um, you may use either the raise hand function or also you can put your questions into the chat option that you have on, on Zoom. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to um, Dr. Carlo Basta from the Center of Constitutional Change, who's gonna introduce our, our speaker. Um, but before this, I would like to extend a big thanks to Pravar Fektar, who is attending and who has done an impressive job in organizing the event and who is managing all the technology behind the screens, which is allowing the event to take place. So a big thanks and I'll hand over to you, Carlo. Uh, thank you, uh, Alessandra. Uh, thank you for organizing this event. Uh, am I audible? You can hear me, right? Good. Um, thank you for organizing this event and also for inviting the Center on Constitutional Change to uh, host. So my name is Carlo Basta uh, and I'm here because I'm the co-director of the Center on Constitutional Change here at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I'm also happy to feature this event as part of uh, a new series with the CCC on comparative perspectives on secession. I just want to use the opportunity to kind of plug the event that we're going to have in exactly a week. Uh, on the 25th at 4 p.m., which is going to be on the politics of constitutional change and secession in Spain and Canada to provide some historical kind of context to the kinds of things that are happening or might be happening in, um, in a relatively near future in the United Kingdom. Um, now, before introducing Dr. Dr. Bosacoma, I just wanted to note uh, how timely I believe that uh, his book actually is. Um, and how timely it is for us to actually be hosting it here at the University of Edinburgh and in Scotland, obviously, given the, uh, the context, particularly the political standoff between the Scottish and the UK governments on whether or not to hold another uh, referendum on Scottish independence, or at least when to hold one. So any book, as Dr. Bosacomas does, uh, that discusses the morality and legality, among other issues of unilateral secession, I think is a very timely one. Um, so very briefly, Dr. Paolo Bosacoma uh, is a lecturer in public law at the University of Pompeu Fabra. He's also uh, lecturing at the Open University of Catalonia. In addition to the book that he's presenting uh, for us today, he has written um, another volume in Catalan on secession and integration in the European Union. And he has made also a number of other contributions to the study of self-determination and secession, constitutionalism, citizenship, nationalism, territorial autonomy, uh, and uh, federalism. So on that note, again, uh, just uh, echoing uh, Dr. Kasana Sadam, I want to welcome Dr. Bosakoma. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be invited to present my book on morality and legality of secession. So, and I would like to thank the organizers and Elisenda, Carlo, Asanga, Etc. for thinking that my presentation could be of some interest. I hope, I hope not to prove you wrong. So now I will try to share screen. Why, why this book? Despite many claims and perhaps wished that demand for self-determination uh, would tend to disappear, with globalization, democratization, liberalization. This seems not to be the case, at least in the UK and, and Spain, as well as in other parts of Europe and the world. This rather empirical reason for writing the book uh, must be connected to a more theoretical finding, which is the lack of theory on the people and peoples compared to the plenty of theory on government and power. Okay. In particular, I thought it was necessary to develop a theory of secession for liberal democratic context. As many democracies have proven capable of establishing kratos uh, from reflection and choice, the formation of the demos uh, should no longer depend on accident and force, but on reason and vote. What's the concept of secession that they manage? Secession is defined for the purpose of the book as a separation of part of the territory and population of a state with the attributes of sovereignty in order to create another state with similar attributes of sovereignty. 
this definition would include external and internal self-determination or uh, secession, sorry, unilateral and consensual, peaceful and violent secessions. Okay? This uh, internal secession is particularly useful in a context of the European Union. Okay? What uh, this definition does not include is redemption, dissolution and expulsion. Okay? That would be terms that I would not include in this term. Um, but not being included doesn't mean that we cannot make analogy or we can maybe we can make some interesting analogies okay with the cases of dissolution for instance um, i tried to develop a contract theory of secession for too long contract theories which have inspired and guided constitutionalism have forgotten to address the personal and territorial scope of their social contracts the, to correct this background, this book proposes a hypothetical multinational contract of Rossian inspiration, okay? which is uh, to be compatible in parallel, I call, with the contract between persons that Rawls develops in a theory of justice and the contract between peoples that John Rawls develops in the law of peoples. Another preliminary question is, why a contract theory grounded on national self-determination? So since membership of national communities does not generally stem from talents, achievements, or political values, it provides members with a wide range of personal choice, as well as a secure and lasting sense of identity and belonging. This makes national groups into, or this makes these uh, national, uh, this makes national groups to become um, appropriate units to form polities and self-governing units. This more or less it's inspired by Will Kimlicka. Moreover, the contract theory of secession I present today is grounded on national self-determination because you can see the reasons in the slide, because the states are not nationally neuter, but often nationalizing, because nations produce and enhance values such as trust, fraternity, and solidarity, which are crucial for uh, democratic and welfare states, because national identity is a significant part of identity of individuals and failure to respect it, it could uh, harm these individuals or it could affect individuals' welfare, as uh, Charles Taylor uh, has written. Um, to make a, a parenthesis here, um, Alisenda asked me or uh, suggested me, maybe why don't you use neutral instead of neuter? And, and that would be reasonable in Anglo-Saxon languages, but my uh, background in Romanic languages um, inclines me to use neuter because I distinguish neuter from neutral, okay? To explain the idea that the states are not national neuter, but can be more or less neutral. One thing is they are not neuter, but then they can be more or less neutral. Although a state cannot be completely neutral towards nationality, some of them can reason and behave in neutral ways or in more neutral ways than others. So neuter has a property that cannot be, uh, or it's not gradual and neutral as something that can be gradualized or that can have decrease, but maybe that's some kind of nonsense uh, in Anglo-Saxon Anglo languages, I don't know. Mm, let's turn to the hypothetical multinational contract I proposed in the first part of the book, which sets the basic principles of the multinational state and the basis of what I call justice as multinational fairness. I will be talking about justice as multinational fairness, justice as multinational fairness, that's the way I call my theory is a way to say instead of saying my theory, my theory. So I, I just name it justice as multinational fairness with this Rawlsian inspiration. Um, inspired by the teachings of John Rawls and my grandmother, justice as multinational fairness is based on procedural or pure procedural justice. Let me pause here and explain to you the relationship between Rawls and my mother. It's not a love affair, don't worry. So they both um, they both praise pure procedural theory. My grandmother used to say, one cuts 
and the other chooses to my brother and I, okay? So um, when she said that, she wanted her children uh, to share in a fair and autonomous way a desired dessert, such as a cake, okay? This ancient method ensured that the cake was distributed fairly among the parties, since the divider would get the remaining piece that the chooser didn't pick. Okay. So that's that's the inspiration. That's that's something that I always heard at home. One cuts and the other chooses. One cuts and the other chooses. Okay. And as you see, it's an autonomous met method, but also it ensures fairness. So that's that's why when I later in life read roles, I thought, oh, that's my grandmother teaching. So and that's more or less why I started this method and why I tried to develop this method in, in a multinational setting. So back to Rawls' method, the hypothetical multinational contract adopted and adapted the original position and the veil of ignorance. The original position is an ideal context in which the contracting nations are equally represented uh, to sign a hypothetical contract without being con conditioned by arbitrary contingencies or unbalanced social forces. The veil of ignorance would guarantee the fairness of this contract since behind, uh, behind it, the contracting nations would not know their political, military, demographic, economic, and cultural weight. Um, this slide contains the entire hypothetical multinational contract, which is far too long for one slide, but relatively short to encapsulate a contract theory of succession. So I just wanted you to see that it actually exists and it fits in one page. Article one of the multinational contract, which deals with the principles of multinational union, includes the principle of non-discrimination, the principle of equal opportunities and equal recognition, the principle of multinational solidarity, and the principle of internal self-determination. I must say that I reflected less on this first article that on the second article that I will now present. Contracting parties under the veil of ignorance or behind the veil of ignorance would think that the right to exit could promote and guarantee a more robust recognition and accommodation of national pluralism within the multinational state, which are the main aims of the just mentioned Article 1. Why is Article 2 needed if the contracting nations already agreed on Article 1? Because these contracting parties would sense that such an internal arrangement within the multinational state might collapse, become inoperative, or be considered deficient by future generations. Prudence would dictate that since the interest of future generations within democratic nations can evolve over the years, the multinational contract ought to include a democratic mechanism to allow minority nations to exit the multinational state. Um, the tyrannical potential of majority rule, together with the possibility of being permanent minorities, would also push contracting nations towards a secession clause. In sum, the contracting parties would see a qualified, a qualified right to secede of minority nations as both rational and fair. Accordingly, Article 2 would be subject to several procedural, substantive, and material requisites encapsulated in the seven principles that you can see in this slide. And I'm not going to read them, I think. Now I'm going to deal with theories of secession. Um, but why, uh, before dealing with theories of secession, maybe that's a question is um, why I'm so interested about morality if my field is law. So laws concerning secession are usually biased and deficient, especially in Spain, or someone would say. no. So moral argument is especially important in this kind of context. That's why. So now I can say that moral theories of secession can be classified in two main groups, remedial and primary theories, as you can see in the screen. While remedial theories conceive the right to secede as a remedial, uh, as a remedy, sorry, against injustices, for primary theories, the right to secede 
should not necessarily be remedial. Primary theories tend to be divided into two groups, ascriptive or national theories, which assign this right to special groups such as national communities or federal or federated units, and elective or choice theories, which grant the right to any territorially concentrated group of people. Justice multinational fairness tends to develop an eclectic theory that can overcome some of the traditional problems of remedial and primary theories. And which are these problems? A main objection to remedial theories is that injustice should not determine the existence of, the, of a right to secede, but the conditions and requirements to exercise it. These theories should pay more attention to the value of self-determination. Since under remedial theories, only injustices grant a right to external self-determination, they generate perverse incentives in magnifying and provoking mistreatment. In other words, remedial theories give excessive importance to tragedy. And by doing so, they may even foster more tragedy. By contrast, a main objection of primary theories, and especially to choice theories, is that they conceive the consent to political obligation in a libertarian manner, as if it was a matter of private law rather than public law. This leads to an overly permissive approach to the right to secede, which causes excessive instability and other problems related to the lack of loyalty, such as blackmailing. In the final analysis, the moral debate on secession focuses excessively on pure types, which tend to operate in an all or nothing fashion. Conversely, more complex and gradual theories should be proposed and discussed. The justice as multinational fairness and justices do not determine the existence of a right to secede, but the requirements to exercise it, as I already mentioned. Therefore, the more just the state treatment of minority is, the more qualified the right to exit ought to be. Making secession difficult rather than impossible, especially in liberal democratic contexts, is, is a better theoretical and practical approach, I contend. Justice, as well as legitimacy, is a matter of degree. Even legality, I didn't want to talk about that, but even legality is a matter of degree. But sometimes for institutional and practical reasons, uh, the law prefers to ignore or turn a blind eye to the needs or the virtue of gradualism. For instance, a statute is in pure theory at least more or less constitutional, more or less in accordance with the constitution, even though for practical reasons, courts tend to conclude that they are in accordance or not with the constitution. But these are practi practical reasons. Okay? In, in a more theoretical inquiry, we would conclude that they are more or less constitutional. By offering a more eclectic, complex, and gradual approach, justice multinational fairness provides a theory for liberal democratic context that can also adapt to non-ideal context, and I, as I will try to show. The injustices do not explain the existence of a right to secede. Some traditional causes for justifying a right to secede, such as military occupation, selective violation of human rights, or economic exploitation, are considered complementary causes under justice as uh, multinational fairness. These complementary causes should thus favor the recovery of a statehood or the exercise of secession. They should help. They don't they don't determine the right. They don't, um, they don't generate the right. They make it easier to exercise. By contrast, if the seceding nation or its nationalism were manifestly illiberal compared to the parent state, the right to external self-determination would be reduced to a mere right to internal self-determination. The above mentioned principles of the need for liberal nationalism and for respect and protection of minorities, this would disallow this kind of secession. 
will not, I will not try to analyze the legality of secession in light of some of the moral accounts I just explained. As I said, and let me repeat it, moral argument is especially important when laws regarding secession are often partial and efficient. International law has a remedial logic, and it is unlikely that this can change in any near future. So it is an unrealistic utopia to propose a primary approach for general international law. Another topic that we may discuss later is that uh, whether treaty law between liberal democratic states should recognize and foster such a right. Okay, here I distinguish between, between general international law and treaty law, okay, international treaties between uh, liberal democratic states, okay, or unions of liberal democratic states, such as the European Union. That's different, okay. So instead of institutionalizing secession under general international law, as many philosophers have envisioned, justice as multinational fairness is intended to be fully institutionalized under the constitutional law and practice of liberal democracies with the aim of promoting recognition and accommodation of national pluralism, respect for the status and powers of minority nations, cooperation and compromise between majority and minority nations, multinational federalism, integration and stability, new forms of shared sovereignty and constituent power, and negotiated and consensual secession. International law will likely maintain a remedial logic, as I said, as I said, since states are the principal lawmakers, and many of them are neither liberal nor democratic. The principle of self-determination under international law does not include a right to external self-determination, this is to say secession, of minority nations such as Scotland, Catalonia, or Quebec. International law is therefore more inclined to accept and advance a remedial right approach to secession, such as justifying external self-determination based on previous violations or non-recognition of internal self-determination. Nevertheless, the absence of an international right to secede does not forbid unilateral secession. Beyond the traditional doctrine of effective, effectiveness that you can find here with this quotation of Hans Kelsen, um, the book intends to put emphasis and pay attention to international recognition. The book praises, praises that international recognition as a means to create new states since norms, both moral and legal, should gradually reign over facts, especially over those ones resulting from violence, force, and intimidation. The book thus defends the progression of a constitutive, collective, and principal recognition. In general, contemporary constitutions do not recognize any right to secede. Yet, Several historical and current constitutional acts, which are listed in the book, recognize uh, a right to secede or to external self-determination. And even without express constitutional recognition of such rights, interesting doctrines, interpretations, and instruments may flourish to respond in legal, democratic, and negotiated ways to secession claims, such as in the UK and Canada. The book tends that, ideally, a secession claim should be clearly expressed both via representative and via referendum. Yet, the central authorities have recurrently refused to allow a referendum, the secession process may move forward without the democratic legitimacy of the referendum. This is to say, the secession process may move forward with the democratic legitimacy of the elected representatives only. Descending to a more institutional and practical issues, the book argues that objective in the wording of a referendum question ought to be intelligibility, conciseness, simplicity, vernacularity, straightforwardness, neutrality, and legal correctness. 
so many fancy words that it's difficult to pronounce. Um, regarding the clarity of the majority, several, several uh, techniques for ensuring a qualified majority in favor of secession are analyzed. Since referendums with approval and turnout, and turnout quorums are problematic, several alternative proposals are made, such as requiring a qualified majority of representatives or successive referendum um, or successive referendums at separate times, series of referendums, you know, cross time. Domestication of secession may take place through institutionalization. Okay. In Canada, uh, this took place in a more judicial fashion through the Quebec secession reference that we all know, and in the UK, in a more political way via Edim, uh, Edinburgh Agreement. Technically, the constitutionalization of a qualified right to secede should be conceived as a special type of constitutional amending procedure. In this vein, I argue in a forthcoming paper that Article 50 of the Treaty on the European Union should be taken as a special type of treaty amendment procedure similarly to Article 49, and both of them complement the ordinary revision procedures of Article 48 of, of the Treaty on the European Union. In the end, a qualified constitutional right to exit could grant voice to minority nations as well as ensure loyalty to the multinational union. That should be the purpose. We should uh, try to strike this balance between exit, voice, and loyalty. Most states tend to establish legal obstacles to secession which in this slide I have classified depending on how difficult they make secession in legal terms. Express eternity clause, implicit eternity clause, constitutional revision to secede, constitutional revision to hold a referendum as in Spain, legal requisites to hold a referendum as in Canada, qualified constitutional right to secede as some of the constitutional acts I have uh, been mentioning or in the USSR, uh, legislative requisite, requisites to secede um, as in the USSR again. So, in general, both unity or loyalty to the multinational union, as I said, and secession, both exit and voice to minority nations, um, should be taken seriously if, they, if both unity and secession are taken seriously, New legitimate meanings can be given to constitutional barriers to secede, as I'm now going to show you uh, sorry, in this slide. These barriers to secession may legitimately, may legitimately try to prevent undue threats and vain secession and vain secessions to require the expression of a genuine constitutional people rather than simply um, of a secessionist leadership or unreflecting uh, secessionist masses to give time for any potential unionist uh, majority to emerge by, uh, um, by Bruce Ackerman writings, to wait for negotiation and agreement between the seceding unity and the parent state to promote deliberation among factions. And this, this waiting time should at least give more chances for factions to deliberate. Um, although if there's no opportunity, there's no chance, if there's no channel to, to legally secede, then possibly this deliberation can end up in polarization that we don't want either. That's why we always try to strike a good balance. To prove the presence of a sovereign, cohesive and enduring people, to protect individuals and minorities, and to guarantee overall, the fulfillment of the principles of justice as multinational fairness that I stated. The last chapter presents a constitutional, last chapter of the book, of course, presents a constitutional theory on unilateral secession based on the awakening of a new constituent people for cases where there is no constitutional option, sorry, 
is a state. This constitutional theory is inspired by Bruce Ackerman's We the People. So I will try to read the, the main paragraph of this theory, um, which is, uh, given the revolutionary nature of unilateral secession in liberal democratic context, only after a long path seeking negotiated and constitutional ways will unilateral democratic avenues back by extensive, intense, and sustained popular mobilization be able to legitimately overcome the constitutional barriers and raise the seceding nation as a constituent people. In the end, in liberal democratic settings, unilater unilateral secession is and must be a difficult target. And back to the beginning, and this is the last slide, in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton wondered whether the societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice. More than two centuries later, we may say that many democracies have proven to be capable of establishing government from reflection and choice, but the establishing of the people or peoples still depends too much on accident and force and too little on reason, deliberation and vote. Thank you for your patience and your time. Hope you enjoy it.